Well, good morning. It is good to see you all. Um, all right, my wife's side of the family is here in town uh, this weekend. So last night before uh, I went to bed, I went down and I counted. There were spots for 12 people were going to be sleeping on my floor in my basement. And, um, oh, it gets better. Don't worry. <laughs> and that didn't include the 10 people that were sleeping upstairs. So we have had a full house. We've been living very close to each other for the last 24 hours, but it's good to have family here. Um, and uh, man, I, I'm excited to share with you today. If you have your Bibles, hopefully you do, turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 15. We'll get there in just a little bit. But before we do that, I want to share with you just an update of an opportunity that my wife and I had um, just last month. So back in 2016, the idea came forward to us pastors of directing some of our missions money through Speed the Light. So Speed the Light, when you hear that word, that is um, the student organization for Assemblies of God. Um, and, and those funds, that's the way students can give to missions, and th- those missions dollars are given to support missionaries that need um, equipment. So it could be anything from a, a vehicle, that's typically the, what they need most, vehicle, to sound systems, um, things like that. And so in 2016, this opportunity came up for us to be able to support and supply some water wells. And uh, very quickly we found out that one of the missionaries that we support, Jeff and Wendy Garrett, they live in Tanzania, um, that they had already actually requested for some water wells. And so we decided to team up with them. And so from the early on of 2016 up until even happening today, um, we've been uh, directing some monies, uh, doing some fundraisers. We've been taking offerings on Sundays. The students have done so even on Wednesday nights, fundraisers, all that kind of stuff. And it has gone towards these water wells. So since 2016, just an update for New Hope, um, we have helped support 21 wells, which totaled $249,000. So you guys have done an awesome job. So uh, last month, my wife and I were able to travel to Tanzania, and we were able to help dedicate six of these water wells. And uh, you'll see up on the screen, it's not super close, but this is a picture of the country of uh, Tanzania. And in the southern part, on the far, kind of the bottom right-hand corner, there's this district called Lindi and Mtwara. It's right on the Indian Ocean. Uh, That's where we traveled to, and that's where these six particular wells were there. There's been the other, you know, 15 or so are scattered throughout the country, but we were able to travel there. We met up with five other uh, people from churches from Arkansas and North Dakota, and uh, they were there also to help dedicate churches. So where we were dedicating the well, there was a church, an Assembly of God church that was also had been built, and uh, they were there to help dedicate that. So um, we um, came across this um, story, which I think is uh, fascinating how God is, is working. But in Tanzania, the Tanzanian Assemblies of God, and you'll see this is a picture of the side of one of their vehicles, um, they were approached by the prime minister of Tanzania, not a believer, but uh, realized that there's a need. His home district is Lindi, where these six wells were. So he approached the Tanzanian Assemblies of God and said, would you please put in water wells? And in exchange, you will give you the land to put it on. All right, this is a big deal. Think about this. This isn't like our democracy here, where we can just go and we can go through the proper channels and have the money and, and you know, buy this land. These are in, in primarily Muslim communities. So as a, a Christian, organization, uh, an Assemblies of God pastor to go into a Muslim community and ask to purchase land to put in a church, easily could have been told no, or easily could have been charged this exorbitant amount just to get money out of them. And so when the government says, we will give you lands, uh, you kind of take that as a green light, like we'll do what we can. And so this is in the prime minister's district where these six wells were. And so next to each water well, um, they planted an Assembly of God church that cost no more than 1500 to $2,000, which was supplied by BGMC money, Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge, our little kids give to missions, and that's what it is. And so a, a great kind of teamwork that has been taking place there. Um, so for the government to be able to open up that opportunity and the government to approach, um, that's a pretty big, pretty big deal. Um, it made things a whole lot smoother. 
You know, when we arrived, we had uh, government officials with us. We had uh, police escorts. And so it, it definitely set up the church and, and the people who were in charge of the well very well. And the community and in the villages saying, these people are here. They're here to stay. They have our support. Stay off, right? Stay away. Don't bother them. Don't give them any trouble. And so um, next to each of the water wells, there was like this cement plaque. And, and there'll be a picture up here. Um, Pastor Luke, if you could show, yeah, right here. So this is the well, one of the wells itself. And you'll see at the bottom, um, there is a, a cement plaque. And this, water, this says in Swahili, um, basically this well has been funded by New Hope Assembly Church America by Dr. Magnus Amiche. Um, he's the assistant superintendent of the Tanzanian Assemblies of God and gives the date. So pretty cool thing for each person that comes up to get the water in these very remote villages. They're reading this plaque and they know that there's a church in the United States that, that is praying for them and supporting them and uh, encouraging them. And so this was a, a, a huge gift that these people got. Um, I cannot say enough words, in enough words, how grateful they are how thankful they are to have clean water. Um, for us to be able to have just a quick water bottle like this, and we can go, we just have this at our discretion, uh, is no big deal to us. But in, in other countries, and you know, primarily for us in Tanzania, we witnessed firsthand at the, the disparity that, that is needed there. They need this so badly. And so these people were so grateful, very, very thankful um, for this. So it was life-changing to them. Think about this. They don't have to walk a few kilometers in one direction to get dirty water any longer. They have it right there in their village. Um, they now ha can have jobs. So instead of going to another village to buy bricks to build their homes and their businesses, they can make their own bricks and, it, and, and they can sell those bricks to the people because of the water that's right there. Um, it's making them healthier physically healthier. So that means they're living longer. And think about this. If they're living longer, they have more opportunities to hear about Jesus. And what a, what a great opportunity. So not only physically is it changing it, but then it's next to a spirit-filled church where that pastor is there. He's been commissioned by the Assemblies of God there in Tanzania to preach the Word of God. And they're, they're there getting physical water, and then they're going to hear about the spiritual living water of Jesus Christ. What a great opportunity that, that they have. Um, real quick, there's a, there's a picture. This is one of the churches, actually, um, that was there. The pastor's next to us. There's the well and, and a lot of the kids from the village that are there. We had just dedicated both, and uh, man, they were like— uh, to see Americans was a big deal for them, but also for them just to have this well in the church was an amazing thing. Uh, there's going to be a picture up on the screen next of someone who just a few miles from each of these water wells is in a dried up riverbed just north of him or just above him is some cattle. To the left is people waiting in line. You see a bike tire right there. They're waiting in line to get the water with all his jugs. And if you notice what he is uh, trying to get his water out of is just this mud hole. And that, that is reality for a lot of people. And unfortunately, uh, you know, there's this massive need. There's a huge need there for clean water. And so then the next picture will show you this is the difference. So no wonder they're so grateful. They're so thankful that they can have clean water. Uh, for them, they would put these five-gallon buckets full of water on their heads and just walk. And I'm thinking, I can't even carry that with my arms. You know, how are you balancing that, not getting wet? I would be drenched. There would be a cup full of water left after me. But they are so talented in doing that. Um, so each well is an average of $18,000, U.S. dollars, an average of $18,000. And it all depends on how deep they have to dig. Sometimes they have to dig real deep. Sometimes they don't have to dig very deep at all. But the average is about $18,000. So let me put this in perspective. There's a picture of three pastors that will be up on the screen. Uh, these three guys here, there's a fourth one that wasn't uh, in the picture. But these three here are former Muslims, now Assemblies of God preachers. And uh, pretty cool thing, yeah. So for, so an, the average salary, monthly salary of, of these gentlemen who pastor in these villages, these small villages, is less than $5 a month. 
So making less than $5 a month. So put that in perspective, $18,000 at $5 a month, that would be over 300 years of your lifetime, if you live that long, to be able to fund just one. So generations worth of your family would be raising and doing all this work. So this was life-changing for them. This was a huge deal for them to be able to get this gift. So let me put this in perspective. It would be like if someone gave you $14 million today, just you gave, gave you $14 million. That would change you. That would change your family. You'd be able to pay off debt. You could be able to give, be more generous, all this kind of stuff. So for them, it's hard to put into words how thankful that they are for all of this. So uh, there's a video, and he speaks very softly, but this is the assist, assistant superintendent of the Tanzanian Assemblies of God. He wanted to say thank you to New Hope. Uh, we I would like to say thank you very much for your support, especially the support of this well, because uh, according to the situation of this area, it's very dry, so people, they are suffering to find water, so the women can travel far away to fetch water. So since we drill this water, I mean this uh, water well now, people are coming here and taking water. So thank you very much for your support. Maybe God bless you, bless, bless abundantly. Thank you. So that is just one of the many people that we met that would say thank you. So before we jump into our scriptures today, um, one uh, thing that some students are doing out in the lobby, they have some Speed Delight coffee mugs that uh, you can purchase and the money's going to the water wells. They sold a ton already, so there's not many left. But um, if you don't need a new coffee mug, maybe you could use a new um, hot chocolate mug, maybe. So <laughs> it's up to you. But all right, well, let's get into the Word of God today. Um, there, was, uh, there is a famous cello player, his name Yo-Yo Ma. How many of you have heard of Yo-Yo Ma? Okay, you probably heard this story. He had a cello that was worth two and a half million dollars and he was in, in New York City. He gets into a cab. I've never been there before, but I've seen pictures of the thousands of cabs that are all over New York City. Gets into a cab, puts the cello in the trunk, goes to his next destination, gets out, pays the cab, leaves, forgets about the cello. And all of a sudden, panic sets in. He can't, he doesn't know where it is. You know, how are you gonna find it am, uh, amongst all the thousands of, of taxi cabs? So it took most of the day, the police, um, people in government, you know, a lot of people were enlisted to help, and finally they were able to track down this cello. Can you imagine, like, the panic that sets in, you know, that, that costly of a cello to be able to lose it? And then the elation to find out that it was recovered, you know, it's, it's intact, it's good. Um, I want you to know that just like that, that lost cello, there are people all over the world who are lost, spiritually lost, that without the saving power of Jesus Christ to change their heart and change their life, they will spend eternity separated from him. And, and to me, I'm not okay with that. But I realize that I can't reach the world by myself. Um, we support, New Hope supports, um, some missionaries that are on teams called Live Dead Teams. And they go into primarily Arab nations. Um, and this, this is where the gospel is not accessible, that less than probably 1% or half percent of people uh, know about Jesus. And so these teams go into these live dead zones, what they call them, to preach the gospel. Um, so in these areas where live dead teams are, there's 4,600 unreached people groups. 4,600 unreached people groups. Um, so that, um, from their website, says it's just under 3 billion people without access to the gospel. So people desperately need Jesus. I don't know if you can see that, but people desperately need Jesus. Today, but even at the time that Jesus spoke these words that we're about to read, um, G people need Jesus. So in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells us three parables of things that were lost. He tells us about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And uh, today we're just gonna focus on the middle section of the lost coin. But I, I highly encourage you to take your, your uh, Bible today and read the rest of this chapter. Even if you have before, read it again because it's powerful. So Luke 15, let's read verses 1 and 2. It says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Let's stop there for a second. 
So this is setting up why Jesus tells us these parables. The reason why Jesus tells us these parables is because he wanted the Pharisees and his disciples to realize and understand that God the Father searches for lost people. He doesn't sit back and wait for them to come to him. He is a loving father who, who is actively pursuing lost people. I want you to understand something is that Jesus attracted sinners. The Pharisees, they repelled them. The sinners came to Jesus, and they came to Jesus not because he catered to them. He didn't just like, just answer everything that they needed, but he cared for them. And the Pharisees didn't. The Pharisees, they had uh, this critical, judgmental spirit about them. They knew the Old Testament law, but they didn't have the love in their heart from God Almighty. And so Jesus is speaking not only for, for those listening, but especially um, to, to come against the spirit. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, right? The Word of God tells us that. Um, the Pharisees had a really hard time understanding that. And they had an even harder, un- uh, harder time understanding the fact that they themselves needed Him, right? They themselves were lost. And so that's why Jesus is speaking these uh, parables. So let's jump to chapter, or verse 8 of chapter 15. Jesus is speaking. He says, Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So in this short little parable here, I realize there's a few ways that we could talk about this, about the rejoicing that takes place when someone comes to Jesus, about um, how God searches and and those kinds of things. But there's two thoughts that I want to focus in on uh, today that stand out to me. The first one is this, is the value of the coin. The value of the coin. Usually we panic when we lose something of value, don't we, right? Because either it's monetary, it's, it's worth a lot of money, or, or it's sentimental because of the person who gave it to you. Now, let's just show of hands, how many of you have lost a wedding ring? Yes? My mother-in-law is here, she raised her hand. Anyways, imagine, you know, those of you who have lost it, you know that panic feeling, but that panic feeling just sets in. You're like, I can't believe this. A, because this is probably worth a lot of money, and B, because my husband or my wife gave it to me. So there's panic that is set in. That is a, it's something that is valuable to us. The mark of a married woman back then, and this is possibly why Jesus was sharing this part of the story. The mark of a married woman back then was a headdress of 10 silver coins linked together by this silver chain. So for years, this young lady would be working and saving up to to acquire these 10 coins. And each coin is worth about a day to a day and a half's worth of wages. So this is what, these weren't just like cheap, like nickels and quarters that we have at our discretion. Um, These were a lot of money uh, to this young woman. And so when she wore this headdress after she was married, it was like our wedding ring. Like it was a symbol to those around that she was married stay away. Uh, and when she had, the, had this headdress, it was so much hers that even if she ha- had debt to pay, they could not take that piece from her because that was so much hers. And so just like that wedding ring that would be lost, even one of the 10 coins that was lost, she would be searching because it was valuable. Also on these coins, it's worth noting that it would have the image of the ruler that day on the coin. And I want you to understand something that you and I, we bear on our lives the image of our creator, of our king, of our ruler, God Almighty. Whether you're saved or you're lost, you bear on uh, your life the image of God. And even though that image has been marred by sin, when a, a sinner is found, when that lost coin is found, God begins to restore that divine image. Um, if you've ever been to an art museum or an art show, um, it's amazing how some pieces can be called art. Has anybody ever thought that before? Like, man, just not getting it. And, and I'm not super artistic, so it takes me like twice as long for, 
compared to everybody else to get the point, you know. But uh, there's paintings that are out there that are just amazing. And uh, you could see how people would pay a lot of money for them. So real quickly, I looked up a couple of Picasso paintings and what they've gone for in value. And in just two, like, um, auction bids, two of them have gone for over $104 million for Picasso paintings. Now, if you were to come up here today and you had a Van Gogh and a Picasso painting, uh, I would not be able to tell the difference. Would anybody, you know, we're, it's hard to tell the difference. Some of you could, yes. Uh, but for me, that's, it's not my thing. But here's what I've come to understand. The value of the painting um, is, is because it's who painted it, right? Picasso painted it. Now, if I painted it, um, I would have to pay someone to buy it, right? <laughs> Um, but a, a Picasso is valuable because of who painted it. So the experts decided that his work stands out above his peers. There's other paintings that are good, but his stands out. Listen to this closely. You are valuable to God. And that value is determined by who created you. It's not by what society says. And the same goes for the lost. This isn't an elite club we have going on here, everybody. Every person needs Jesus. We are valuable. Jesus came to live and to die for us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his love for us and that we were, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So you're valuable because of who created you, but you're also valuable because of the price that was paid for you. The son of God came. He gave up his life. And so, so my prayer today is this, is one, is that, man, we would see the value in people. That we wouldn't just see that we are valuable, because we are, but our eyes would be opened up to see people the way that God sees them. And not have a a judgmental spirit. And I'm not saying we do, But uh, if we're not careful, we can fall into that trap really quickly, can't we? We can fall into this uh, us for no more type of group, and and you're not, if you don't know the things of the Bible, sorry, tough luck. We need to have the heart of Jesus within us. So there's value in the coin, and there's also effort that was given to find the coin. Have you, has anybody ever tried to find something just by talking about it? I can't find my phone. Does anybody know where my phone is? I haven't seen my phone. I don't know where it is. You just talk about it all the time, or you complain that you can't fight it. And come on, let's, let's be honest here. Anybody ever done that? Okay. All right. Uh, I will lovingly have to tell my children this every once in a while, not, not a lot, and I'm sure my parents had to say this to me. So I'm like, you, your parents have to say this uh, to your children, but this, look with your eyes and not with your mouth. Right? Look with your eyes and not with your mouth because you're not going to find it just talking about it. You're going to find it by looking. You're like, get up, get off the couch, and go find whatever is lost. I want you to notice something. This woman that Jesus talks about, she did not stop until it was found. It wasn't like she gave it a good 30-minute look and said, well, can't find it. We're done. No, she kept looking. She kept searching. Back then, the houses were dark, no electricity. So it's candles and lamps that you have for light. The, the floors were dirt, most likely. And so it's not like it was just, a, you know, set on a table type of thing. So she was very persistent. She would sweep the house. She would move things to one side and look. Then she would move things to the other side and look. She was intently looking. And just to find that glimmer of a coin, almost like finding a needle in a haystack. Listen to this. The effort that was put forth for your soul, the effort that was put forth for my soul is something that we cannot repay, right? We can't repay what Jesus has done for us. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13 says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Those two words brought near means something happened. Something 
uh, took place. Effort was given. You, you had to be brought near. Someone had to go out and find you to bring you near to Jesus Christ. And I want you to know there was effort that was given for your soul. But there was also effort given for those who are lost. The, the co-worker, the, the schoolmate, uh, the, your neighbor who maybe drives you up the wall. You know, they, they disagree with you on everything. And that you don't see eye to eye on anything spiritually. You know what? Their effort was given for their soul too. They matter to God. And when every person is, is worth the effort, then I think it, it, it causes us, it needs to cause us, it drives us to our knees, but also drive us to our feet to go out and do some work. Wouldn't you agree? We need to go out and do some work. Worship team, you can join me up on the stage or on the platform. Um, you'll see a, a picture up on the screen of a cornfield. And about a year ago at this time, I was driving with my family and um, I, I sensed God speak to my heart. Um, there it is. Um, speak to me on something that he, you know, this isn't the actual field itself, but I, I sensed myself standing at the edge of a field like this, and I, God's Spirit said, what if I asked you to harvest this field by yourself with no equipment? And I'm like, ugh, that would be terrible. That'd be so much work. You know, that would take effort. And then it was like the second question was this, what if you could have people come help you? And I'd be like, all for it. You know, it would take all of us to maybe put a dent into something like that, right? And, um, and, and God began to speak to me, um, and he said, how crazy would it be for, for me to stand at that field, seeing work that needs to be done, and then go to the field next to me and grab those workers to come to my field? It'd be crazy. It'd be like it, when I was in Tanzania, asking them to come here, in which I asked them to pray for the United States. Listen, we need Jesus, all right? We need Jesus. Uh, their mantra, their motto, the last 10 years has been Tanzania for Jesus. And they are reaching people like crazy there. And I said, please pray for us that we would also see a revival take place, that we need Jesus just like you do. And how crazy would it be if for me to say, would you please come to the Urbandale? Would you come to the Des Moines Metro? And would you reach people for us? This is our harvest field, right? They have a har harvest field too. And unless God calls you to another country, another place, this is where we're supposed to be. Luke chapter 10, verse 2 um, it'll be up on your screen, but if you have your, your Bibles, you can turn to it. Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Here's the, the conversation that God was speaking to me um, in the car as I was looking at this cornfield. <clears throat> Here's what Jesus says. He's talking to his disciples. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Notice this. The harvest is plenti plentiful. A lot of people need Jesus. 40% of our world needs Jesus. They live without access to the gospel. So the harvest is plentiful. But notice what Jesus says next. The workers are few. Sometimes we glaze over that, that statement, but here's what it says to me. Few people are actually doing the work. We see the job that needs to be done, but Jesus even recognized it back then. At, um, work, the workers are few. So what does Jesus say next? He says, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. He says, ask for more help. He says, pray for more people to come and help. I want you to notice that we're, we're supposed to ask for more help, not an easier task. We're supposed to ask for more help, not, not an easier job. It's going to take effort. We're, we're supposed to ask for more workers, not other people that will do our work. Too often we get way too comfortable in our church pews and we're willing to be here on Sunday morning for a select hour and 45 minutes. But then when we leave this place, we forget that that's our harvest field, right? That's the job that's supposed to be done. And every one of us has a harvest field. Every one of us has a place that we're supposed to reach. Your school, your neighborhood, your family, your job, whatever it may be, that's your harvest field. And unless God calls you somewhere else, that's where you're supposed to work. Don't wait for someone else to come do your job. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, Who, whoever watches the wind will not plant. So if you're waiting for the conditions just to be right, just to plant that seed, it may not always happen. And then it says, whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. The conditions won't always be just perfect, 
The stars won't always align just in line for you to all of a sudden uh, tell someone about Jesus. It's going to take effort. You're going to have to step out a little bit, open up your mouth, and I'm speaking to myself here too, and we have to speak the words of truth in love to people. We need to lead people to Jesus. Kindness is good, but man, sometimes you got to open up and you got to speak. God doesn't need us watching and cheering as other people do the job. He doesn't need that. Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, to go into all the world and make disciples. He doesn't say sit back and wait for the right conditions. He says go, go, do the work. John Wesley has a quote that he says, the church has nothing to do but to save souls. So spend and be spent in this work. It's going to take effort, everyone. Please, my prayer today is this, is that we won't delegate our responsibility as a Christian. Please don't pray that someone else will come along to do a job that you're unwilling to do. We need to get into the harvest field. We need to do the work. But I want, you, I want you to be encouraged today. It's not in your own strength. It's not in my own effort. It's not in a collective group of New Hope doing it. We need the power of God living within us to be able to do this. How much more effective can you be when the Spirit of God is living and residing within you? We can do some good. We can raise some money for missions. But man, when we're praying, when we're reaching people and it's in the power of God, He can do 20 times more than what we can do in our own effort. Would you agree? And so He says, ask for more help. So when I read that, it it encouraged me because I felt like sometimes I'm all alone. I don't know if you've ever felt that before. Sometimes it feels like you're all alone. Ask for more help. Ask for more workers. Listen, you may not be able to reach your unsaved family member that lives across the state or across the country, but you know what? God can send that spirit-believing uh, believer there to that person. And you may not be able to like harvest. You can plant seeds and plant seeds and someone else will come along and maybe harvest. And you're harvesting what other people have planted. And it's a team effort here, but to God be the glory, we're gonna reach souls. And I don't know about you, but I am not content sitting back. And I pray that you're not either. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes before we sing this closing song? Today, if you are lost spiritually, you are like that lost coin, you know it, you recognize it, and you're ready to give your life to Jesus Christ for Him to be your Lord and your Savior, to follow Him, to be uh, dedicated to Him. And you would say, that is me. Would you pray for me? Would you please raise your hand? I want to pray for you. Man, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Thank you for being honest. Is anyone else? Thank you. There's no shame. This is a a safe place to say, man, I need Jesus. Jesus, those that responded with their hands, and even those in their hearts, they know they needed to. I pray that you would reach them. Would you save them, God? Would you reunite their heart with your heart, Lord? And as a lost sinner comes to you, as they place their faith in you, we know that there is rejoicing in heaven, just like your word says. So help them to grow. Help them to mature in in you, Lord Jesus, and trust you every step of this way. Those of you that raise your hand, for that part for salvation, please see me at the Fresh Start Center after the service. The second question is this. If you wanna see people the way that Jesus does, you're tired of of having a judgmental spirit on people maybe who don't know him, or this, or you're tired of sitting back, you're tired of delegating your responsibility, you're tired of waiting for someone else to do the job that you're unwilling to do, and today you're saying, you know what? I need to get back into the harvest field. I need to get back in and start working again. I I relegated my responsibilities, and today I'm picking them back up, and I'm ready to start working again in the harvest field. And you say, that is me. I need Jesus, and I need to jump back in the job. Would you raise your hand? Say, God, this is me. See my hand today. God, we need you today. We don't want to sit back and watch. God, we don't want to sit back and wait for for someone else to do the job. Would you please reignite our fire, reignite our passion? Would you stand with me this morning? Jesus, we need you. God, we cannot do life without you. We need your power. We need the spirit of the living God to live within us. 
so we can have that fruit, so that we can go out into the harvest field and we can work. It's going to take effort, but I pray that we would not be uh, waiting for someone else to do the job that, that we need to do. But God, give us your eyes to see value in every person. Every person matters to you because you created them. So God, I pray that we won't just see value in us, but we would see value in other people. So today, God, as we uh, make this moment yours, I pray that you would have your way. Holy Spirit, speak to hearts and lives. Firm up what you need to firm up in our spirits, Lord Jesus. And as we declare the song to you, there's hope in your name, Jesus. May that take place in Tanzania reach people for you in Tanzania, God, but would you do the same here in Urbandale, Iowa? In your powerful name, we pray.